Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Resolution Foundation. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the director of the foundation. And so you're all very welcome here today. Yeah. When Stephen has found a seat, we'll keep uh -huh. yeah. uh, Right, now, um, there's not a lot happening in British politics, <laughs> is the bad news, apart from Brexit. That is happening, uh, at least at the moment. The, um, uh, but there is something big happening, and in some ways, huge. And I was saying to these guys just upstairs, the, um, there were people over from France yesterday, who obviously, the first thing they want to talk about is like what is happening to Britain, but the second thing is what is going on with this huge change to your social security system that is so big that nobody else in the developed world is trying anything like it. The, um, uh, how's it going? The, um, I obviously told them really well. The, um, uh, but so while Brexit dominates all of our politics, the, um, uh, it is important that we don't miss the fact that we have this huge domestic reform, I mean, seriously huge domestic reform um, going on. Now, there is obviously some political row you get, you know, it does make it into the news now and again, universal credit, in the, in the form of a big political row, uh, but not often enough in terms of detailed engagement with what's going on and also detailed engagement of what it's doing to people's lives, which is obviously what we all care about and what people, whether proponents or opponents of the scheme, uh, should care about. And that is a particular challenge because later this autumn we're moving into what might be the most difficult phase of universal credit, the managed migration, which is what we're talking about today, which is the moving of people who have not chosen to start claiming universal credit, but are being told that they're going to stop claiming uh, the existing uh, legacy benefits. The, um, so that may be the most difficult, just by on the virtue of that, but we'll come on to it. Now, getting that right is crucial, not just for the people who get that, but also to the reputation of universal credit. And I think we've probably underestimated, including us, how important that is, because the increased take-up of benefits is probably the single biggest remaining win to be had from the rollout of universal credit, if it delivers. But the reputation of universal credit is a crucial to that take up uh, benefit. So getting this right is really important. Now, to help us get it right, the panel we have today is on my right, David Finch, a senior uh, researcher at the foundation, who's written the report that we published today and is gonna give you a short summary of it. He promises short, he's never told me the truth before. Uh, then Ian Davidson, Sir, Professor Sir Ian Davidson, who is the recently appointed chair of the social Security Advisory Committee, which I think has to tell the government what it thinks about the transitional regulations by 20th of September? Of that order. In the order some, around then. <laughs> we'll be asking for a three month pause. Okay, fine. <laughs> 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 the deadlines. Uh, but has helped, I'm not going to go through all of Ian's jobs he's done recently, but he's been recently was the Vice Chair and Chancellor of the University of Aberdeen, among other things. And then on my left is Kayleigh Hignall, who is the Head of Welfare Policy at Citizens Advice and has done a great job of making sure that the voices of people coming into systems advice bureaus up and down the country and others and the lived experience of universal credit feeds its way into the uh, machine of policy making in Westminster. So that's the plan today and then we'll have a Q&A. So Dave, over to you. Okay, great. <coughs> Okay, sorry. Um, so just to start with, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, background detail as to where we are with universal credit before getting into the kind of detail around um, the managed migration. Um, I think to start with, it's worth pointing out that we're kind of past what was a really um, kind of long stage of having um, big implementation issues and not really getting to anywhere near scale with the process. Um, and we're currently now in a stage where um, universal credit is starting to be what they call naturally migrated out um, to, to new claims to benefit. Um, we've had a kind of, we've already had one big political row about that last autumn uh, where we had um, the discussions around the six week wait. And I think that the real lesson to learn from that is that eventually the government dealt with that problem, which was really um, stemmed from a lack of fit with people's lives and the, the processes UC brings in um, by, um, by providing people with a, um, a HP run on. So basically they bought out the problem um, and, and also shifted the risk, the financial risk that was being created by UC away from individuals and back towards the government. And I think that's an important thing to think about for the managed migration. Um, uh, but despite those kind of problems, it actually seems like universal credit is in a bit of a, is actually building up a bit of a head of steam. It's um, continuing to roll out this month to another of around 50 job centres. And that's going to keep on going till the end of the year, um, at which point it should be available in all job centres for new claims. And that's essentially, um, that's what they mean by the natural migration. Um, the next big phase is the managed migration. Um, that's where we're going to actively move people from who already have existing cases onto the new benefit. 
Um, that's one of the reasons why it's potentially very difficult because these are people who aren't necessarily asking to be moved. Um, they're going to be effectively told to move. Um, but we think they'll probably start off with a fairly big political round in the autumn as the details of those rules are debated. Um, and then following that, it's not really going to get up to anywhere near scale realistically until sort of 2020. So 2019 is all about testing and 2020 is when we'll start to get people moving on at scale, at least to kind of current plans. Um, and then if we take account of all the changes that have happened so far, the latest kind of estimate for rollout of universal credit to be completed is around 2023, um, so that, which is effectively a decade after it first started to be implemented. Um, I think that's potentially uh, raises the question of why um, why have people bothered to persist with universal credit um, given the problems we've seen so far um, and and also the kind of big ne negative perception that universal credit is currently um, getting which appears to just be growing in the public eye um, and I think you can turn to the kind of two key advantages of universal credit the first um, was really around boosting the generosity of the system especially for working families and also improving kind of financial incentives for people to enter work and progress um, and then also the other important thing was that um, to boost incomes by improving take-ups, so by having a single system of support, everyone will get all of the benefit they're entitled to through a single claim. Um, but what we've seen so far is that on that first um, advantage, those have really been undermined by a series of cuts to, to universal credit, especially um, the kind of work allowance cuts that came in from 2015. Um, but we're still expecting very big gains from take-up. Um, so around... Um, the OBR estimated this in steady state, it's around 2.9 billion a year for 700,000 families. So that's a really important boost that universal credit could provide. Um, the risk is that that negative perception starts to chip away at that, those gains. And if management, but the managed migration goes wrong, then it could really start to tip things over the edge. Um, so just looking at um, what we think might happen through the managed migration, um, and I'll plug the OBR's Welfare Trends report from earlier this year, which really sets out a lot of really useful detail about what might happen during that managed migration phase. Um, so this chart is just showing you the, um, it's the caseload of the managed migration up to 2025. Um, obviously there's a lot of assumptions made about this. Um, it's important to remember these aren't all the managed migrations managed migration cases as, an, as a cumulative inflow. It's the people who are counted as managed in each period. So some people will leave this process because their circumstances change. Um, the, the main two features of the caseload is that it's largely split between working families, which are the kind of darker blue bars, and then um, ESA claims, which are the lighter blue bars. And I think that's where um, the reason why this um, process is likely to be so difficult, because you've got one group of very much the most vulnerable people on the system who are going to be asked to move onto another system, and that's probably going to be very hard, as it's happened, as has been proved in the past when people have tried to reform disability benefits. Um, but also, you're also planning to move a core group of people who tend to be um, very live in, in the kind of political sphere of um, who are low-income working families or are just managing families. So both carry significant risks. Um, so getting the migration right will be really important. I think the other thing to note here is that the um, over time, the ESA cases tend to dominate. And that's really suggesting that the working families probably won't be in what they call the managed migration process for long. And the, the problem with that is that you, um, you get transitional protection, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, later. But this suggests that those people are churning out of that potential protection. Um, so in thinking about how um, we think that managed migration should proceed, I think we've set out some core principles. There's more detail in our briefing, um, but I won't go into all the kind of detail now. Um, but I think the one thing that we've, we've done is take an approach of focusing on the migration itself. So um, we're not trying to deal with all the, the underlying problems that we think are in the universal credit system. We've kind of dealt with those at length in previous reports. Um, but really, I think those need to be tackled at root rather than being dealt with through the migration process. Um, although obviously they make it harder. Um, we think a key principle is that DWP should bear the burden of financial risk rather than the individual. As, um, as the process is proposed so far, um, people will be asked to, um, will be issued with a notification letter telling them to make a claim for universal credit by a certain date and if they fail to, well, and if they don't do so, and, and even if they do do so, their um, current benefits will be closed down. There are mitigations in there, um, so vulnerable claimants will try to be identified, but I think the burden really should be on DWP to make sure that they don't close any of these cases down until a UC claim has been successfully made. Um, and by successful, that means providing all the relevant information you need to process the claim fully. Um, the uh, other things that um, we think 
really the migration phase should only begin when you've got, when it has meet, met certain service standards and that those have been agreed by external experts, so bodies like SAC, um, the Work and Pensions Committee, um, the NAO, so that, um, so that DWP aren't just starting the migration process and then suddenly lots of problems occur and, and that external people are happy with how that process will, will happen. In that way we can hopefully, um, won't run into some of the problems we've seen so far um, and we think that's around Get, getting to a point of at least around 90% of claims being paid in full and on time um, within that first kind of five weeks. Um, at the moment, in the latest DWP published statistics, are up to around 83%. Um, so we think there needs to be a review of those processes to make sure that you can get that up to the 90. Um, the final element we think is that there should be a focus on transitioning some of the simpler cases first. Um, that previous migration profile suggests that actually they're going to um, take the similar approach that's happened so far where um, the universal credit is rolled out by geography because you've got a kind of similar blend of cases moving on each month. We think um, there's obviously benefits to doing things, um, testing things out at a local level at a small scale, but when you, if, you're trying to, um, if you're trying to maintain momentum of the rollout and keep numbers up, then it might be easier to move some of those simpler cases across first. Um, so the, the other important element of, um, of the managed migration process is transitional protection. So this is where um, at the point you're going to move on to universal credit, a calculation will be done to see if you are going to be better off or worse off than under the current system. Um, if you're worse off, you'll get a cash top up um, that covers the difference. It's, in reality, it's more complicated than that, but um, I'll, if we just keep that kind of concept in mind. Um, and this chart is just showing how people are expected to flow in and out of the managed migration. And so this tells you how many people will be um, moving in and eligible for that, potentially eligible for that transitional protection, but then how many people will be flowing out and so no longer eligible. Uh, it's not the people who will get transitional protection, this is just all people on the managed migration. Um, so we can see in 2019-20, the, the blue bar is your inflow and the red bar is the outflow. And if you can see that, then it's, um, it's very low and it's because we're not expecting big cases in 2019. 2020, things start to speed up a bit and you've got a big inflow of around 650,000 cases coming in um, and only a small outflow that year of around kind of 80,000. And then the purple bar is your stock at the end of that year. Um, and that's split pretty evenly between in and out of work cases. Um, the next year, um, another big inflow, but this time those outflows are starting to pick up. Um, and again, you can see that um, you're starting to see a bit more of a shift towards kind of out of work cases at that point in your final stock at the end of the year. Um, and that continues again into 2022. Um, and here you can see those outflows are starting to pick up a bit more and that balance is firmly shifting more towards the out of work cases. So um, what this is implying is that you're going to have quite significant churn of cases um, within a year or two of moving into the transitional protection. Um, and also the majority of those are coming more likely from working families and it's due to changes in circumstances, um, which is obviously a potential concern if um, that transitional protection is not going to last for that long. Um, clearly there'll be cases where people um, do have a genuine change in circumstances, which means they maybe move off the system entirely. We need to make sure the system isn't um, removing that protection too quickly. So. Um, I think it's worth noting that transitional protection was always going to be necessary. Um, it's one of these points that we always expect gainers and losers in universal credit because of the size of the reform. Um, and that's why transitional protection has always been a part of the, of the reform so that it stops those people who are facing an immediate loss um, from being cash losers. Um, we think there is a risk um, in kind of, in focusing on transitional protection that um, if it lasts for too long, it's going to start to create big inequities with people who are moving through the natural migration. And actually, the majority of cases will be naturally migrated. So the extent to which transitional protection um, can actually help to mitigate the losses people are facing is quite limited. And, um, and so really the focus, that we're worried about the kind of underlying generosity of UC, and that's the kind of in-work support, it's the support um, particularly paid to younger single parents. Um, that really needs to be tackled with, with basic reform of the underlying universal credit structure. Um, the one thing we do think is important is to protect people from short-term earnings volatility. The way it's designed at the moment, um, especially if we think about the kind of income disregards that exist in tax credits where people can earn a bit more but not have their um, claim affected, people will see some erosion of their transitional protection if they're earning, or an effective erosion of their award if they're um, earning a little bit more. So we think there should be some form of disregard so that people can um, maintain parity with the tax credit system for longer. There is more in the report, but I won't um, go into huge details on that now. Um, 
I think we'll just finish by giving a bit of um, a summary of the position then. So, um, so it feels like um, the managed migration is being discussed as quite an immediate thing, but in reality it will, it will be going on for a number of years. Um, it probably won't be over until the sort of second half of the next decade, but we'll still have some cases who have come through that process. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely time to think and get this process right. That starts in the autumn when um, we'll have a renewed focus on universal credit and, and a political discussion as, it, as these regulations go through Parliament. Um, we've, um, we think uh, in, within that debate, we really can't forget that the, the managed migration process is all about making sure it works for families, that they don't have a bad experience in that process and that the financial risk that they're facing is really um, dealt with by, by the government rather than them having to shoulder the burden of that move. Um, I think it's also important that um, I think in the past the, the design of universal credit has felt quite closed. Um, DWP are being more open and are having wider discussions now with stakeholders and I think that's important that continues and that there is agreement on the kind of um, the processes put in place and the standards that DWP are delivering before the migration starts. Um, I think the, f the final thing is really that this, is, um, this next phase is really crucial in helping to restore Universal's credit's reputation. And the kind of reason to, to really worry about that is this final gain that's now still apparent in Universal Credit, which is the big take-up. Um, I suppose the, the other point to make, and we've obviously made many times before, is that um, it's also a good opportunity. Um, to go back and look at the wider design of universal credit that includes the processes and the generosity of the system, especially for um, working families and single parents and second earners, and think about reinvesting in that so that you help to um, make this migration process smoother. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Ian, over to you. Jordan, thank you very much. Can I also thank you for the opportunity, firstly, to speak with us. It's always a pleasure to be here at the uh, Resolution Foundation. I've enjoyed every opportunity I've had. Um, can I also say that I urge you all to read uh, the contributions that David has just um, talked about and also the one that Kaylee will talk about, the really <laughs> magnificent um, treatises on the issue uh, that we face. This is the second talk I've given this week. The first talk I gave um, was on Monday in Cabrera. Cabrera is one of the biggest informal settlements in, in Africa. No one knows how many people are there. Um, I would estimate around a million people in an area uh, of about one and a half square kilometers. It's um, a sobering place to spend some time. I tell you this for two reasons. Firstly, it makes you pretty proud that we've got the kind of benefit system that we are going to talk about. But secondly, the path-breaking work by uh, Niovani Medice and Alex Eze using longitudinal data in um, this informal settlement shows the effect to which people, if you like, are making do. But then a crisis of some sort, perhaps the stopping of some money for some reason, or a life event like health, can push people over the edge. So you're kind of you're going along, you're making up, and then something happens. And that why do I tell you this? Because that in particular explains one of the reasons why the Social Security Advisory Committee chose to do this consultation. Remember the Social Security Advisory Committee has been around for 40 years um, and aims to provide advice to the Secretary of State on issues both of uh, regulations uh, and uh, of uh, legal change, but also on issues that will impact on the social security system. And as we already have, this is going to affect 2.8 million people in 2.09 households. That's a real matter. But these are the most vulnerable. These are the people who, if something happens, if benefits are stopped, could be, as I've just said, pushed over the edge. We need really to make sure that we have a system which, if this managed migration happens, as it happens, it is smooth uh, and effective. And secondly, this has to be one of the big challenges for DWP over the next little while. The scale of the challenge is important. Put those two things together, a significant number of the most vulnerable members of our society, together with the scale of the challenge for DWP, and I think that made uh, a very important um, reason for SSAC to do this consultation. Um, I also have to say 
that in doing this consultation, clearly our stakeholders also thought it was a reasonable thing to do because we've had a record result. It was 435, but we'll get the Resolution Foundation this afternoon, so we've now got 436 um, uh, consultations. And they have been, I have to say, incredibly interesting uh, and incredibly uh, thoughtful. Before uh, I talk about them, I'd just make two points. We do not aim to summarise our consultation and metaphorically throw it over a wall and hope DWP catches it. The whole vision that I have of this committee is that we will co-create with our colleagues uh, at uh, DWP um, work which will be helpful to uh, members of society. So that's how we've been having consultations. I've already had two extremely positive uh, meetings with Alok Sharma, the Minister for Employment, and he takes a very similar uh, view. So I'm very positive about uh, the way we move forward. Secondly, um, this consultation is about the managed migration. Many of our, um, many of our uh, consultees <coughs> have taken the opportunity to, com to, to uh, comment uh, on universal credit, some positively, some less so. But we um, will not be, if you like, commenting on universal credit per se, but on the managed migration. As we already heard, this is um, something with a large number of people, and 54% uh, of the tax credits, 36% are on ESA. This is significantly uh, the most vulnerable. And what we're really going to focus on is the operational readiness, um, and on four criteria. Is this deliverable? That's uh, part of I really welcome uh, the Resolution Foundation's um, suggestions around you know, holistic KPIs, and it's important that, that we've got that framework and an understanding. Is it explicable? Do people actually understand what's going on here? Is it proportionate, and is it fair? Now, look, we note that uh, there is comments, uh, as David said, about how, about how slow uh, progress has been in some ways thus far, but equally, we are really clear in our mind that we should not now suddenly rush. We need to make sure that this is, um, if you like, tested. Uh, I'll say a few words about what I mean by tested a little bit. This is tested to, to, to real success. When we move forward, it has to be smooth. Uh, and Neil Cooling and his team will need to be ready uh, and able properly to scale up and to manage things. Because, as they just said, there has been um, some if you like, lack of confidence sometime uh, over the last little while in what many people welcome. Um, but uh, we do not need that confidence to drop any further. So who responded uh, to our uh, consultation? A significant number of individuals. And the claimants, parents of disabled children, um, many, many uh, individuals. Large numbers uh, of civil society groups, such as the CAB, um, and we've held some um, workshops, we had a workshop recently with MIND because of, if you like, the significant issues around people uh, with mental ill health. Um, many local authorities, I'll say just a few local authorities really did come in and say, oh, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. We're very worried. We've not been engaged as much as we would like. Uh, we are worried also that we may lose data that we already have. And thirdly, if this all goes pear-shaped, we'll be the people who've got to pick up the pieces. Mm. So local authorities are concerned, uh, and uh, we've got a workshop later today to hear about those concerns so that we can uh, share them, uh, and hopefully um, DWP will be able to uh, overcome them. Um, so let me just take on those four areas, explicability, um, fairness, proportionality, uh, and deliverability. I'll start with explicability, both at a macro level and at a micro level. At the macro level, this process needs transparency. It needs transparency about what success looks like, it needs transparency about the timing, and it needs transparency at, at a national level about how we are going to make these really quite significant steps. Secondly, at an individual level, we did get, as I say, a large number of individuals writing. And absolutely what they said to us was, what does it mean for me? But it's not quite what does it mean for me in a kind of positive, um, everything's fine. It's what does it mean for me in a, I'm really scared. 
I don't have a fear of the unknown here. And what does it mean for me to be, the, am I going to be in trouble? And so what this says about explicability, it seems to me, is communication, communication, and communication. But communication needs to be in the right way. And it needs to be at the right time. So communication to people who tell us, uh, I don't open brown envelopes. They scare me. Um, perhaps um, if you're uh, homeless, it's not quite clear where that brown envelope goes to. Um, and people who perhaps are worried about um, reading and understanding what is there. Or indeed uh, people for whom life is a just-in-time event. And if you just find out you're going to do something tomorrow, that's too late. There needs to be plenty of time and plenty. So I'm not going to tell you how you communicate effectively to the most vulnerable in society in plenty of time and do so in a way that people can receive messages clearly and easily. But it is clear from this consultation uh, that there needs to be some work in that direction. Secondly, deliverability. I'd have to say that right across our um, consultation has come a certain scepticism, a certain scepticism of the ability to be able to scale this up. So that's there, um, and I think that comes back to communication, because people want this to happen, but there's a scepticism of being able to do it. So we need to overcome that with communication and being able to be clear about how um, the work can properly be scaled up. And there's a real concern about test and learn in one way. When people say just individual claimants should not be guinea pigs. Uh, now I have to tell you, I have been reassured uh, about some of this is because clearly one has to work with people to work out exactly how to do things at a small level before you scale up. But that people have said that to us. Uh, and we do need, I think, evaluation and monitoring. And a lot of people have said uh, to us that we should um, consider asking uh, for a pause uh, to achieve some of these areas. Proportionality. Bottom line is, should everybody have to make a claim? I'll come back in a minute um, when I talk about fairness um, and, and say where should the risk be. But actually, should it not be possible, we have been suggested, uh, to migrate people automatically on the basis of the information that is already held. With the availability, this is my input, of big data and the opportunity for linked administrative data across government, it ought to be possible to be able uh, to, to, to move people automatically. If not, where data do not always exist, then could not much of the forms be people as much as possible by data that exists. Um, the MP would argue <coughs> that this provides an opportunity to update those data. I suspect that many of our consultees um, would not um, completely agree with that statement. There also needs to be, our uh, consultees would say, an enormous push to enable help for people in um, filling in forms, for example. Much of the work to be done online. Let me be clear. For a lot of people, doing things online makes it easier and available and relatively simple. Fine. But what our consultees have said to us in many cases is, for many others, the most vulnerable members of our society, this is going to be hard and frankly scary. We need to be able to support those people and there needs to be a pretty easy um, set of rules, our consultees say, as to how people can get telephone help. And I know people can um, visit a job centre, for example, but if you live, and there still are some really good rural areas of our country, I've just spent the last eight years in Scotland, and let me tell you, um, 
there are some big distances and public transport is not great always most vulnerable members of society could find it pretty difficult mm -hmm. to do that uh, and therefore we need to do everything we can we believe from our consultees uh, at the moment that home visits in many cases or in some cases will need to be able to be done to stop people falling through the crack and finally fairness um, many of our consultees said that risk should firmly be held with the state here. We should not be passing risk on to um, the most vulnerable members of our society. As the Child Poverty Action Group said to us, and I quote, quote, draft regulation is designed to place burden of arranging migration and financial risks almost entirely on the shoulders of claimants. By definition, <laughs> this is the group least able to bear these risks. Unquote. The quote goes on and makes a number of very sensible suggestions. But I'll give you that quote, not just as one, but as one of many uh, that people have said to us. And we also believe, in terms of fairness, that we should think through the distinction between explicit and implicit consent. Explicit consent um, is um, asked for, but implicit consent, um, there are many MPs who, for example, uh, do things on behalf of their uh, constituents, and absolutely rightly so, and they have implicit consent to be their constituents. It doesn't have to be there for the actual moment. And we believe, that particularly for the most vulnerable members of society, there needs to be that kind of support. Of course, just in case you thought I was going to go on for six days, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, about, totally relaxed. I'm about to stop. Phew. Those are the four areas that uh, we will be focusing uh, our results on. We are still in consultation mode, though. As I've indicated, we've got two workshops today further. We're reading all the consultations, and this, particularly the Q&A, is part of our consultation. Dawson, thank you very, very much for uh, the opportunity to speak. We will, uh, we hope by the end of September, submit uh, to uh, DWP our results, but it is a DWP decision when they publish it. So I cannot tell you the date of publication. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Ian. Great. Hey. Should I stay here? You can stay here, you can Fantastic. stand, you can dance. I'm you stay. Gonna, I'm going to stay, okay. thank you. Go. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep it quick. Um, largely because there are a lot of areas of consensus here, um, which is fantastic in many ways. Um, I'm hoping it's making your job of sifting through 436 responses a little bit easier, um, and hopefully government's job a bit easier in terms of what to do next. Um, as you can imagine at Citizens Advice, universal credit is a big deal for us. Uh, we help 2.6 million people a year, and benefits are our biggest inquiry area. So this is a huge amount of change for the people we help, and actually for us as an organisation as well. Um, like many, and like has been noted already, we do agree with the aims and principles of universal credit. There's many challenges, and I'll touch on them in a moment. But, you know, we do see that it has the potential to address some long-standing issues in the benefit system. Uh, Take-up has, has been mentioned today. For us, the ability to report a change of circumstance once instead of to three or four different departments, or, in fact, change different benefit systems when you have a change of circumstance are, are key and very important areas of, which we help people with a lot um, in the legacy system. Um, it's worth remembering a few things when we think about universal credit uh, and its next steps. Really, this benefit was designed nearly 10 years ago um, and a huge a lot has changed in that time, uh, both with the benefit, which David has touched on in terms of the value of it and its underlying principles, but also contextually, people's lives have changed, the way they work, the, what we expect from the state or from systems, what tech can do, all of those things have changed. Um, and it's been around in some time, in some form, uh, for some time, but it's still really relatively green, actually. So Universal Credit Full Service, which is the current version and the version that will be rolled out across the country by the end of the year, and that those managing, uh, those being migrated over, will experience, is only just hitting the two-year mark now. Uh, it only hit the million mark in terms of claim numbers earlier this year. 
So there's still a lot to learn. There's still lots of rollout to go, actually. Even though we've only got a few months, there's a huge number of areas moving on to universal credit in those months. Um, and a lot to implement, like known issues, known fixes to actually put in place. Remaining functionality actually to be built during that time. So it's still relatively green. Uh, we're not talking about a system that is complete and ready to go on necessarily to its next phase. Um, Taking all that into account, we, like many others, responded to the managed migration consultation with some principles. Um, I'm going to rattle through them because, as I say, consensus is really clear here across organisations um, and I, I suspect across government as well. Um, the first one for us is about readiness, and, and Ian and both David have touched on this. Um, we're really clear that there has to be success measures that are transparent, and also crucially that there has to be clear breakpoints. This is a problem with the rollout schedule as it has been over many years now. There are not, not necessarily clear points where the department has time and capacity to implement changes uh, and to make fixes to fully evaluate. Pace of rollout has been very fast um, when, when it moves, um, so yeah, it, it needs those those break points, both in terms of next steps, do we, when do we start managed migration, and then throughout managed migration. The second is around that prevention of sudden loss of income. This is like critical for people. Benefit income is a huge source of income for people who use it and have it. It's a large proportion of their income. It covers really key bills like rent, gas, electricity. So moving with that and having a financial shock to it, a sudden loss of income, is absolutely a no-go from our point of view. Again, we agree that the, the burden of risk, but also of administration, shouldn't fall on individuals um, in terms of like making the claim. And I'll go through this in a minute. It's a really burdensome process. There are many stages to it, many points that it can go wrong, even without the managed migration element to it. Um, so that burden shouldn't fall to the individual. As you would expect, we think that adequate support needs to be in place. We've been saying this for quite a long time. Even if you ran this system perfectly, the fact that you're talking about millions of households in different circumstances moving to a new system that they don't know requires an adequate level of support. Then build in the fact that we're testing and learning, the fact that there are still bits to be built and still bits to learn from, and that support requirement becomes even higher. Um, so we think at the moment there's quite a lot to do there. Um, the current system isn't necessarily consistent across the, cover, uh, across the country. Um, it doesn't necessarily provide the right type of support, so support specific support to make and complete a claim. Um, and it doesn't provide adequate coverage, either in terms of location, as Ian mentioned, but also in terms of availability. So a lot to do there. And obviously the biggie here is looking again at those facing losses. It's hugely costly, but really important, whether that's restoring work allowances and looking at them again, whether it's looking at gateways into the benefit, as government have done recently and we welcomed around the severe disability premium, so stopping those who face biggest losses moving into the system without transitional protection or whether it's looking again at the effectiveness of transitional protection in itself. Something needs to be done in that area. So for us, bearing that all in mind, there's quite a lot to do with the regulations, but we're really glad government do seem to be engaging um, and consulting on them and taking time around them. It's important to remember as we enter this next phase, and David mentioned this too, that rollout um, as is happening and universal credit is happening over the next couple of years doesn't just mean managed migration. Actually, the proportion of people who are going to naturally migrate, so move because they have a change of circumstances, or make a new claim is greater than those who are going to be managed migrating. Um, and obviously, we can't forget those people who are on UC and experiencing it day to day. That's hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so we have to make sure that we take this opportunity to look at those wider um, problems. Now, at Citizens Advice, we've helped already 120,000 people uh, with 200,000 issues with universal credit. It gives us great insight into what's happening on the ground, um, particularly for people who are experiencing problems with the area. Um, we mustn't forget, as universal credit rolls out, that this is a huge change and challenge for people. Um, we're talking not just about a new benefit, we're talking about a new department, a new claims process, including a new kind of channel to communicate with government, um, new payment structures, new budgeting, and all of that falls at a time when people potentially are going through a big change of circumstances themselves, so relationship breakdowns, loss of a job, uh, potentially um, developing an illness, and in a world where we know people don't have savings, they don't have a buffer, and potentially are already in debt. Um, so all of that means that getting this right is absolutely crucial. 
Now, we, may, we really do welcome changes the government have made already to acknowledge problems uh, with universal credit. And um, given the tight timescales on rollout uh, so far, and given the amount to do, there is a kind of capacity challenge in terms of making and implementing all fixes that are needed. Um, so there are outstanding issues that need addressing for sure. And I just want to quickly finish, <laughs> you'll be pleased, um, with a few kind of lessons that we've learned, two or three lessons we've learned in the process of rollout so far. I'm going to keep them high level because as you can imagine I could talk about this forever and as you guys so, know. So yeah. <laughs> um, so the first one is that collaboration is crucial. Organisations, departments, locally, <coughs> nationally, have to be involved, engaged to be able to make this a success. Ian noting about implicit and explicit consent is an important factor of how you make sure that's possible. The second is that universal credit has to work for everyone. Significant groups are having a positive experience of universal credit and we do welcome and acknowledge that but there are others who are facing really big challenges and often those who are in quite different circumstances. Um, the benefit really isn't tailored or designed for those people and that is a challenge. So even where adaptations are available, people are struggling to access them or don't even know about them and that's even people who come to Citizens Advice not knowing about these, these adaptations like alternative payment arrangements for example. Um, there are obviously then people who the system it doesn't have any adaptations to. So people who have non-standard incomes, people who don't have monthly wages, are really struggling with this system. Um, and there is a chance for some of them that it does exacerbate their volatility of income rather than helping to smooth it. So lots to do in that area. Um, Ultimately, it sounds counterintuitive, but we do have a simplified system, but to simplify it for individuals, it does need to be tailored. And there is a difference between simplification of the system and administration and simplification for individuals working through it. Um, lastly, delivery is as important as policy in universal credit. Most of the inquiries we get um, relate to delivery and administration of this benefit. Um, and it's more important than ever, considering that all of people's income is in one basket here, or, or significant proportions of it. Um, the claim process has at least 10 stages in it and lots of points there that people can fall out of it. And we know even from DWP's own data that say for example 44% of people are having to make repeat attempts to claim. There's lots of smaller issues here that really are knocking people around in the system. So yeah, it's really important that delivery is given as much consideration as the policy. So, Lots of learning there, foods for four. Um, um, but we do think this next phase does bring a chance to really make the most of the opportunity that Universal Credit brings. Great, thank you very much, Kelly. <laughs> I'm conscious that a lot of this is, it is, it is verging on the um, technical, a lot of the debate yeah. this autumn is going to be about getting this framework right because something then happens uh, in the future. But I think what we're all trying to say to you today is. Um, this matters because it matters for millions of people, as Ian passionately said, for people in vulnerable uh, situations. And um, with some sympathy to DMP, moving people between systems mm. is hard. For any department, even the best administration in the world would find this hard. Um, but that doesn't mean the individuals didn't choose to be moved. So in the end, that's where our, we should be sympathy, sympathetic for those having to do it, but on balance, more sympathetic for those having it done uh, to them. Now, uh, there was hopefully lots of food for thought there. Let's get some questions or thoughts. Some gentlemen here, Rob. Uh, Pete. Give us your name. Anna. Pete Chalice from uh, Unison. Uh, I'm glad you focused on the, uh, the, the sudden change in people's incomes <coughs> that they'll experience at the, uh, as the migration process takes place. I mean, essentially what's going to happen is people will get their notice and then they'll, they'll get the date on which that their benefits will end and then they'll have a five-week gap. And it's that five-week gap in which those bills won't get paid or people will have the financial difficulty. Now, actually, there's a two potential solutions to that. Either you can run on existing benefits for a further month mm -hmm. beyond the date in which the regulations suggest that they end, or you can have some transition payment that deals with that five-week period where people won't get any income and do the calculation using the existing information that you have on people's incomes through the HMRC RTI process. And we've suggested this as part of our submission yeah. to the consultation. Great, I'd be interested to hear Excellent. a response. Excellent.
excellent consultation plug. Are <laughs> um, we going to take a few? We're going to take three. Otherwise, we're going to swamp deal with them. Thank you very much for that. Um, great, great presentations. Um, I just wondered whether, in particular, David's um, comments had taken account of the government's um, announcements about changes to transitional protection recently, because you were uh, concentrating partly on the OBR's report from January, I think. And um, recently the government said not just the severe disability um, change, but also about um, people whose earnings increased and also about the capital rule, um, and they were going to change that. So I just wondered whether that was taken into account it in is, the... It um, is going to come back and explain to people what those are well in a second. And then just Sorry, say that again to I said they are, but Thank we'll you. come into the detail in a second. Yeah. David Etherington from Middlesex University. Uh, one thing we've observed is that the rate of sanctions, benefit sanctions, has increased under universal credit. I'm sure the CAB maybe have experienced this and can back, back us up. Uh, data, for example, the data produced by David Webster shows that this is the case. Now, um, okay, we can spend all morning talking about the pros and cons of, of sanctions, but it's, it's evident that um, Sanctions are doing more harm than good in depriving people of incomes. So isn't um, moving to universal credit an opportunity to stop sanctions altogether and move to a sort of different quite of different okay. sort of benefit friend claimant friendly system? Okay. Okay. That's a very big question, David. Um, right, okay. Ian, do you want to kick off on Pete? I, I will kick off on Pete. Um, Pete, I in, in the time available, I couldn't run through all of the answers, but I have to say I have read your answers. We've read them. It's a very sensible suggestion, and it's something we'll be thinking about very seriously as we move forward to the um, conclusion, because it is an issue that we need to take place on. That's right. Um, and obviously, on run-ons in general, the government is also showing willingness to mm. look at those, so that's clearly a sensible way to go. Dave, do you want to find the mention um, on this? Yes, yeah, so I suppose the one thing is, yeah, OBR did their thing um, in January. I think they had some of those changes in. So the self-employed being exempt for six months from the minimum income floor, it was already in there. And obviously, whenever OBR put up a timetable for, for kind of UC rollout, it gets pushed back a little bit. So, you know, I mean, it's it broadly the shape of what will happen. Um, I think it, it, is quite, it is interesting that they've seen some problems in the system and tried to make temporary adjustments to it. So the self-employment change... Um, is only a six month delay on before the MIF is applied. Um, and that's, I think, an example where they obviously recognise that might be an issue for people. Um, and I think we'd prefer that that's dealt with by a reform of the MIF rather than just not applying it for six months. Um, and on varying earnings, I think what, they've, what they're talking about is people who, have, um, who don't have the monthly earnings. And so because they're paid, say, fortnightly, they will have periods where, to, where they get paid they have a number of extra pay periods within their month of UC assessment and so potentially won't get any UC at all. So it's for them that they'll keep their transitional protection entitlement. But I think what we're worried about is that um, if your income increased a, a, to within certain parameters within the tax credit system, it wouldn't affect the money you're getting from, from tax credits, whereas it will in the way transitional protection is being calculated. So it's a slightly... Just make, let's make that concrete for people. Like if, yeah. if someone works extra hours in one particular month or they happen to get paid a bit of overtime in that month, we're just saying don't then, don't, don't have their, uh, their um, transitional protection being uh, eroded away by that one lump up when the rest mm. of the six-month period they're yeah. on. It's the low income, is what we're saying. So that's hopefully clear. Um, Kelly? Um, touch on David's sanctions point, which is not directly on, it's on a big yeah. picture of the future of the world. No, um, and you're absolutely right. We do see the problems that sanctions bring to individuals and the impact of kind of a financial penalty existing in the system. I think the thing with universal credit is it does expand conditionality to new groups and there's still a lot to work out there uh, just in of itself. Even on a practical basis, like employment support allowance claimants experience conditionality before they've had their assessment of whether, how, uh, whether they are disabled disabled or not or have different um, support needs. Um, so there's extra bits like that in the system that are a little bit um, under the radar as well. So it's no surprise that uh, there are issues, more issues potentially with conditionality. I know there's a lot of reporting issues and like data issues with universal credit, uh, both in terms of sanctions but wider in terms of claimant count and the ONS data relating to, to benefit claimants in themselves. So it's quite hard sometimes to see what is actually going on. And it's really critical that the department kind of get to grips with that so that we really can evaluate universal credit 
um, but it is an opportunity to look again. There is evaluation um, happening and testing happening for the in-work group um, who will experience new conditionality. There's nothing to say that that um, evaluation and testing shouldn't be uh, widened out to other groups and whether conditionality is effective for them. And certainly when David's mentioned the minimum income floor, so this is in effect a form of conditionality for self-employed people after a year um, of earnings uh, being below a certain amount. Um, again, you could do lots of test and evaluation and opportunities to look at solutions there within it. At the moment, that evaluation hasn't finished either on the in-work uh, proportion of people or on the minimum income floor, which is a concern seen as we're moving to the next stage of rollout. Um, we'd prefer to see the results of those. Great. Let's get some more questions. The gentleman in the middle here. Where, where microphone is lurking? Is, is this a microphone? Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's John Bibby from Shelter. Uh, and my question is mainly about kind of what you think the chance of success of influencing change on <laughs> this is. Um, I, I, you know, I've heard lots of things about DWP engaging really positively with people on this and being in kind of in listening mode. Um, but it seems clear that from the original design, just on paper, uh, you kind of think, well, this looks like a bit of a catastrophe. Uh, so there must be something motivating that in the first place. There must be reasons why uh, DWP wants to approach it in this way. And given that there is now only quite a short period until um, the, the kind of the original pilots are supposed to continue, um, it seems that there isn't actually that long to, to, to get significant system change before the pilots begin. So I guess my question is, one, what do you think the, the chance of success for influencing is? But two, what do you think those reasons are, those fundamental reasons that the DWP has designed it in this way? That is a great question, John, not least because uh, some of the dangers of this discussion, not least because it's a dangerous <laughs> level of agreement for any panel um, in life is that you don't put yourself in other people's shoes. And so there is a, there are, there is a reason why DWP has chosen to set out the regulations as it has in lots of ways. And a lot of this is about the simplicity of delivering the system. They've built a system to take new claims you then move to look at a migrating a population from old benefits to new benefits. And so putting the onus on putting those people through the system you have built without having a new system that deals with this migration is clearly attractive. And it happens to have the other benefit of putting the risk on the individuals rather than on. Like DUPs had lots of news stories about their IT systems cocking up. So it's not surprising that you build a system for the managed migration, which puts the onus on the individual to deal with that so that it goes wrong it's the individual's fault not your IT system which you've already seen plastered all over the news so that is you know to be sympathetic to the people who are doing a hard job of trying to work out how to do it that is how they've come uh, to where they've come to now let's get some more questions and then we'll come to the panel there's a question right at the front yeah. where is it where is it you ready the mic come to okay I wasn't expecting to be a uh, uh, Sam Ashton from London Councils um, I think we should stop calling this a migration because it's not a migration. People's benefits are going to be stopped and they're going to be told to apply for a new benefit. And that brings a very serious risk that they're not going to apply for universal credit and they'll be left without funds. So I'm, I was really pleased that um, uh, you raised the issue of support because I think that's really key to, to making sure that risk doesn't happen mm -hmm. in that these very vulnerable claimants who we've seen from the, the transfer to ESA, we've seen the experience in the past that all sorts of risks uh, occur when you're transferring people to benefits mm -hmm. and there needs to be a seriously thought out properly funded uh, support system across the country and I, I would like to know what the panel thought that that would look like um, and how it should be delivered. Great questions then and let's come back here and then we'll come across here as well afterwards. So another mic somewhere. Yeah, there. I'd like to suggest that this is neither proportionate nor fair. Um, starting with the single uh, adult unemployment benefit of £73.10, it became the, um, uh, there was a, it was a week, it became £317 a month, and they are equal to each other. And the evidence is absolutely, totally clear, and I've sent it in, I hope, already to the SSAC, that the, um, it has been losing value uh, since 1979. It was always left out because pensions and children are politically more uh, suitable to give money to. So the adults have been left out. The important point, of course, is that all the other benefits are added to the single adult benefit. So your, your housing benefit, your counter tax benefit, your children benefits. Now, I'm assuming that they're all meant for what they are paid for, for children, for housing, for council tax. 
and that if there were any rent to be paid, like arrears, it would have to come out of the adult employment benefit, which of course it can't, because £73.10 is not even enough to be able to buy food, clothes, transport, uh, and, uh, uh, and water, uh, and fuel. So it's a, it's a, it's a broken system. And um, you've got to bear in mind that it's not the only game in town. Uh, 289 out of 326 councils are charging council tax against that benefit, against that £73.10. You can't tax £73.10 fairly. And then you enforce it with £140 court costs. And then you send in the bailiffs for another £500 uh, fees, which I'll, I could break down for you, which I won't now. Don't do that. And yeah. then you've got the housing benefit. I'm sorry, I must finish this. Okay. Uh, the cap, the bedroom tax and the NHS are also requiring £73.10 to pay, adult, to pay rent. And it isn't on. It simply is not on. And just one final point about the telephone. Um, all the people I work with have, uh, have a mobile, uh, which has probably fallen off the back of a lorry, or it's certainly the cheapest available. Um, it runs out of money in telephone calls. There is, the communication is simply not possible from the most vulnerable people um, to the Department of Work and Pensions or the Social Security, uh, the Job Centre. Thank you for a good reminder of the bigger picture. I have more questions here and then we'll go. Uh, hi, it's Julie Jarman from the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. Um, there hasn't been an equality impact assessment done since 2011. Um, I'm really pleased that some of the references to those types of issues Kayleigh, you mentioned adaptations and it has to work for everyone. Ian, you talked about home visits and our experience is that actually reasonable adjustments are simply not happening currently. So we're really concerned that it's being rolled out to manage migration without at least another equality impact assessment um, because we know that when we talk about the most vulnerable, we're including people like uh, people with learning disabilities as well as physical disabilities, mm -hmm. health issues, as well as mental health issues. And let's not forget people who have English as a second language. It's a really complicated and difficult system to struggle through. We'll have evidence of um, Asian women being repeatedly sanctioned mm -hmm. simply because they don't understand the system. So there's all sorts of issues around language as well. And um, also just normal things that should be in place that aren't like access to British Sign Language. So, uh, and, and obviously, um, Really pleased to hear that you're going to pick up the issue on implicit and explicit consent because we've been really concerned about that. Great, thank you. Um, Ian, do you want to keep talking? John, John is slightly challenging the perkiness of um, meetings with ministers and others sounding. <laughs> and give us ground for perkiness. Or well, I'm pretty positive at the moment. I have to say I am very positive. Uh, and the, the, you know, the question, which I think was a, the right question, let me say, is what's the chance of success? Uh, and my own view is that when we migrate, when we migrate, the chance of success has got to be incredibly high. So I'm not going to give you a comment on what the chance of success is if we decide to go tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> but when we decide to go, this has got to be tested. We've got to know what success looks like. The KPIs of the sort that the Resolution Foundation have put in their consultation response have to be met, and the chance of success has to be very high. That would be my view very, very clearly, and that is what I'm sure the committee will be saying. The, um, uh, do you want to touch on that? We've got a whole lot of questions, but on, you've taken up Judy's excellent point on yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, seven years later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is an awfully long time, um, especially since we look at the changes that have been made to the benefit. Um, and then again, looking at, as I've mentioned, changes in society and how things work and how people work or other benefit systems that have been changed as well alongside it and at different points. Um, so it, it does feel like it is the time basically to, to look again at that. Um, I think the challenge that the department have had on this is that they are building and rolling out and testing all at the same time. So some of those more detailed parts are like left for later um, and then people, it takes a long time to get to them or sometimes not get to them. Um, so if you think about rollout so far, um, the significant functionality that's been built in the system as it has rolled out, um, there's still loads to do in what we have recognised already in the previous benefit system. Um, and it, we should say like reasonable adjustments in the current legacy system 
are a challenge as well um, in terms of getting those and we definitely have to help a lot of people there so I think it's an underlying issue that needs to be addressed full stop um, and then addressed more in, in universal credit and I think that's the thing when you reform a benefit system it gives the opportunity and the chance for people to go but what should it be like not just to mark it against what it's kind of been designed as but to say what do we want the benefit system to look like and what do we want it to do and that's entirely logical and reasonable to do but is a different challenge to the department's challenge of rolling out universal credit uh, as it stands so yeah I totally agree we we need to look again at the equalities impact of universal credit we'll touch on SAMS, given that you're the expert in the room on offering yeah, support. Yeah, universal support. Um, so a ton of people already come to us uh, for support at Citizens Advice. So we know a, a huge amount about what is needed in that system um, and how it should work. How actually it's delivered to us isn't the important thing. It's that it meets those criteria. So it has to be consistent. It has to be, uh, I, I love the idea of having to be able to explain something. And I think that should exp like apply to support as well. And there is a challenge there because it's different in every location at the moment. There are a handful of areas where it's working very well and then there's a load of areas where it's not clear what is going on and some areas where we're really seeing problems with how it's working. Um, so yeah, it has to have that consistency so that you can communicate it and so that it has minimum standards that truly do meet what people need in terms of support. Um, and I do think that coverage point I mentioned earlier is really critical. If you're building a support system to help people upskill, to improve their digital skills, for example, which was one of the original intents of universal support, then you can have a system that says, Wednesday afternoons, come along to this place to learn how to um, use the internet. But if you're building a support system that is helped to make a claim, it has to be available uh, when people need it and in places where people go. Um, so yeah, more, more of a what's a successful system rather than the delivery model for it. Um, but I do think those things are critical. Can I just respond to Julie, so that was absolutely the right point, uh, if I may say so. Um, one of the issues here, which I think really has to be addressed, is that typically, in many areas, one says, oh, most people will be fine, and then there are a set of people that we need to stratify into particular groups because they will need particular support. What the point that I think you made very well was that there are very large numbers of groups who are of varying size who will need particular support. The, the people who need British Sign Language will need different support than the, the Asian um, first generation uh, women uh, with difficulty uh, with English. Now, my point being that actually there are so many groups that when we add them all together, this is an area where there are a significant proportion of people needing special support as opposed to in many, many areas is a small proportion. Um, it, was, it was picking up a bit on this kind of um, is it a migration or not point and the extent to which you can actually automate the process and I think um, there's obviously an issue around um, potentially like what is the incentive for people to move and um, unless so in one way the kind of closing down of your old claim is a very strong incentive to move on to universal credit um, but I think there's actually issues with the way in which universal credit works compared to say the tax credit system that means you can't just move people onto it and leave them alone because UC will start to do different things to them. They'll expect things of you. It will change how much you're getting depending on how your earnings vary. So people will really need to know that they're actually on universal credit before it starts to function because otherwise they'll be in as bad a position as if they just messed their claim up in the first place. Um, I think the one place where that probably doesn't hold as strongly is the ESA cases where you don't expect their circumstances to change so much and there you could potentially, if you want them off the current system, move them onto universal credit and then only start to um, treat them any differently once um, they've been fully made aware and they've had that support to understand the kind of the system they're now in. Right, let's get one set, more set of questions and then we'll, there's a lady here. Thank you. Um, Josie Tucker from Child Poverty Action Group. Um, thanks very much, uh, brilliant presentations. Um, and thank you for mentioning our response um, in yours, Ian. Um, just kind of picking up actually quite timely on some of the discussion that's just been happening about the migration process. Um, we're kind of really concerned about, you know, same concerns that many people here have in the room. We know like from a recent freedom of information request that like something like one in five 
claims, attempts to claim failed due to non-compliance with the process, like obviously the process of leaving people to make claims um, is for whatever reason not kind of functional enough for, for a large numbers of people to manage that and that's hundreds of thousands of people if the same were to happen in a with the numbers we're, we're expecting to manage to migrate um, I agree that managed migration is a bit of a, a misnomer um, so we have actually been calling for this kind of the DWP to build new claims and move people over um, we understand like that there are then be some further requirements on people and so we're suggesting like a period of some months to kind of inform people you and our universal credit this is what's needed this is the additional evidence you need to bring adjust any um amounts that you know in the claim that need to be adjusted and take a sort of fairly generous approach over a few months just not recovering overpayments for example mm -hmm. putting in really intensive support to help people get there um, of course eventually if somebody doesn't engage you'd have to think about well, how do you deal with that um, I think your point speaking to your point in um, the fact that so many people will need additional support mm -hmm. I think that's one reason why yes it's important to identify particular groups and try to target support but we really need a process that kind of safeguards everybody through it and some people will have a very obvious like vulnerability category <laughs> but many other people won't all that information won't be won't be known um, on the question of readiness, it would be very interesting to hear reflections from the panel. A um, couple of things that we're worried about, one in particular is the sort of um, key processes in universal credit that don't seem to be fully automated mm -hmm. yet. Um, I know that this was something the NAO picked up and it seems to us that rapidly scaling up while some key processes are still being done manually is problematic, like in particular transfer of information on disabilities from PIP or ESA claims and we know that routinely people are not getting the elements they should be because those are having to be done manually. I don't know if that's something you're picking up as well in citizens' advice. Um, and linked to that and very uh, important for this explicability point which I also thought was kind of a really powerful way of looking at it um, we're finding that like too many people don't kind of understand the amounts they're getting and aren't seeing those breakdowns and that I think that's and then if there is an error like you don't know that your housing cost deduction has been made because universal credit didn't know that you were getting PIP or something you just see an amount um, and we'd like to see a kind of a system <coughs> that's more transparent to, to claimants as well um, so and it would be interesting to see if those are things that you're kind of considering and if you have any insight into progress that's been made perhaps more recently either on automation or on the um, the policy changes that were announced by the Secretary of State earlier in the summer she's um, I'll be yeah on various changes to universal credit that were needed we'd like to see those kind of wrap completed before mass migration great sorry that was long that's all right let's have one question yeah then Yeah, my Roberts from local government. Um, my benefits section is the best in the country. You know, uh, regularly confirmed as such, but we're very concerned. We have lots of people in uh, very challenged areas. We have issues with regard to uh, uh, ethnic groups. We have the largest Nepalese population in the UK, 11,000 in the borough. My two particular points which I hope the panel can have a look at. I went to a GovNet uh, presentation meeting in the spring. The two worst departments on IT structures, one were HMRC, you just couldn't make this up, and the second were DWP. I, you know, I, fa I fear a, um, a TSB moment coming in relationship to the IT structures. You know, um, and let's, let's be clear about that. Uh, the other issue is about job centres. now. Somebody's mentioned about the closure of job centres or the availability of job centres in the rural side. I fully accept that, but don't forget a lot of job centres in urban areas are also being closed and consolidated. So it's not just a problem now for rural areas, it's also a problem for non-rural, maybe uh, urban areas where people okay. will have to go for some considerable distance if they're lucky yep. with poor transport with cuts. To actually get to the job centre. Great. And someone last question here. Uh, Pamela Corder, a member of Rethink and Bipolar UK. And just to follow up the brown envelopes remark mm. that uh, Surian made, um, what steps are being put in place to deal with people's fears, vulnerabilities, the fact that they actually need a great deal of support from other people and proactive support from other people, They're not going to ask for it for themselves? And nor, when people have to describe their disabilities, is that easy. People don't want to say that they're ill. So that's another issue to be taken on board. And I don't see much sign that there's a real 
focus or understanding of the complexities. Super question. The, um, right. Uh, the panel wants to answer those, but and then give us some wrap up as they go in. I'll just uh, t take a couple of points, if I may. Uh, they were actually quite associated points. Uh, if I just would make the, f the, the first point, I absolutely agree that you know, when we are looking at people who need support, it seems to me there are those we can observe and take a judgment that we need support, but there will be, if you like, unobserved heterogeneity in um, society as well that we will need to be able to, to pick up at time. And that may be because people don't know they need support or, as was rightly put, some people don't like to admit that there is an issue. So I think there are real issues um, that we will be saying, or we, I expect we will be saying to the department, about how they make those supports. I, I take your point very much um, that uh, what are we going to do with regard to the brown envelope instead. That's not, at the moment, the job. I'm not trying to pass the buck. Well, I am passing the buck. Let me be honest. Um, that's not the job of the advisory committee. The advisory committee is to say there's a real problem here. You, We will work with you by working with uh, particularly civil society groups to say how best do we overcome that. So if you take your example of people bipolar, how do we best work with those people to ensure that they get the opportunity. And I will also say, and I take your point about um, is this managed or not, one of the things that has come very much across in, in the consultation in which I talked about is the fact that we want to make it into a managed migration by using all the data uh, that we possibly can to move people smoothly uh, and easily. And Mike, I take all your points. Um, what it seems to me we do need to do is to work with local uh, government as much as possible. And I also, and I also take um, the point uh, about urban as well as rural, but I still hold my point that rural is a real problem for some people. Great. Cool. Um, a lot to cover there, so I'm just going to keep it brief in the interest of time as well. Um, totally echo concerns, um, Josie, that you see in terms of the claims process um, and in terms of people's understanding. All of those things come through in the people that we help. We do know lots of people are having a good time of universal credit. You know, it's working for them. It's a system that works, but it's quite clear that there are significant, significant numbers who are struggling at multiple hurdles in the system. Um, and, and there's more to be done there for sure. We do feed all of our evidence in to depart to the department and to make sure that they understand how this is working on the ground. Um, I would say it's quite clear, like from all of the comments made, um, even in terms of job centre closures and the like, there's still a lot of, to learn about universal credit, a lot to put into place and a lot still to build um, in it, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and we just mustn't forget as well, like that brand, brown envelope point, like it really is a massive challenge for people. It's a challenge we've always had. Like uh, if I think about my employment support allowance clients who I help with their claims, it's the same process of being stuck with a brown envelope that you definitely don't want to open coming to us with a bag full of them basically um, but it, this is a massive opportunity to tackle that and as I said before it's the bigger risk because it is all of somebody's income so we absolutely have to crack it um, and there's lots the department can do on that it's good that they are consulting on this uh, whether through consultations or whether themselves so there does seem to be a willingness and, and to the earlier point about chances of success to think more about that learning and to think more about the evidence from other organizations organisations or where they can help in the process um, as we already see all of these people I'm sure there's multiple organisations in this organisation that are in that position um, so yeah just to wrap up lots still to do <laughs> great yeah um, so I suppose just a couple of points the thing around the IT build of, um, of universal credit so far and I think when you look at the kind of the number of people getting paid in full and on time then the, the people not getting paid in full and on time tend to have an extra element um, that they're due and those things like childcare, um, things also I think like rent in the past as well but those also seem to be some of the things that haven't quite been built fully either so I think people are still having to manually report um, childcare costs into into job centres so fixing those and making sure those things are fixed before you get on with the managed migration I think is really important um, and I think as well there is I think there just has to be an onus on this point about making contact there can never be the assumption that someone has understood that they're going to be migrating I think the onus really has to be on DWP to make sure that they've kind of verified some contact 
contact and that the person is making a kind of informed choice essentially that they that they are moving and that they've set up that claim. Um, Great. Yep. Okay. Well, look, the um, obviously background is, is that it, this is all very. Um, technical, but hopefully on the basis that you've heard people's input, you've had 436 uh, consultation responses and you've all turned up means that we get that it's uh, really important. So can we thank uh, Kayleigh and Dave for their consultation responses and can we all wish Ian good luck? <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day everybody.